Kitchen, please. Okay. I want to thank everybody for being here, first of all. We start off the evening with a public hearing. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Darren Rice, our Director of Finance, to uh, review the Financial Integrity System of Texas score. That's a required public uh, hearing that we have to have. So at this time, I'll ask Mr. Rice to come to the podium. When he's finished, anybody who has comments can go to the podium related to the first report, and you'll have two minutes to make your comments. So Mr. Rice, please. President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton, it's my honor uh, tonight to present the School Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas Annual Financial Management Report. The purpose of the Financial Accountability Rating System is to ensure that school districts will be held accountable for the quality of their financial management practices and achieve improved performance in the management of their financial resources. The school first rating is based upon an analysis of staff and student data reported for the 2011-2012 school year and budgetary and actual financial data for the fiscal year ended August 31, 2012. School First Accountability Rating System assigns one of four financial accountability ratings to Texas school districts. Superior achievement, above standard achievement, standard achievement, or substandard achievement. Conroe Independent School District received a rating of superior achievement. This is the 11th consecutive year since the inception received superior achievement. We also have a perfect score on the system also. The Superior Achievement Rating is the state's highest, demonstrating the quality of Conroe ISD's financial management and reporting system. How the ratings are assessed? The School First Rating System rated Texas districts based on their answers to 20 separate questions. Each question was designed to assess the quality of the financial management of the district's resources. As we go through these questions, they'll be looking at our district's fund balance, our cash and our, our investments, they'll look at uh, our audit reports, and also our student and staff ratios throughout the district. So we'll go through each one of these questions. Question number one, was the total fund balance less non-spendable and restricted fund balances greater than zero in the general fund? For the 11-12 school year, we had a fund balance $98,070,118. Question number two, was the total unrestricted net asset balance in the governmental activities column in the statement of net assets greater than zero? Yes, we had $60,265,840. Number three, were there no disclosures in the annual financial report and or other sources of information concerning default on bonded indebtedness obligations? Basically, that question is asking, did we pay our, our bills? The answer is yes, we did. Number four, did we file our annual report on time? Yes, we did. <clears throat> Number five, was there an unqualified opinion in the annual financial report? Our goal is to receive an unqualified opinion, and we did. Number six, did the annual financial report not disclose any instances of material weakness in internal controls? Yes, we received a clean audit. Number seven, was the three-year average percent of total tax collections, including delinquent, greater than 98%? Yes, we received 99.73%. Number eight, did the comparison of PEAM's data to like information in the annual financial report result in an aggregate variance less than 3% of expenditures per fund type? Yes, we had 0% variance. Uh, number nine on this indicator, you just needed to match one of these. We actually matched two of the three. And if you look at the second one, if the district's five-year percent change in students is equal to or greater than 7% criteria, we had 13.08% increase in students. And also the third one, property taxes collected per penny of tax effort is greater than 200000 Ours was a little over 2 million. Number 10, were there no disclosures in the annual audit report of material noncompliance? Once again, we had a clean. Number 11, did the district have full accreditation status in relation to the financial management practices? Yes, we did. Number 12, was the aggregate of budgeted expenditures and other uses less than the aggregate of total revenues, other resources, and fund balance in the general fund? Yes. 
50 districts, aggregate fund balance, the general fund, and capital projects fund was less than zero for your construction projects adequately financed. Yes, our aggregate fund balance is $154,855,305. Number 14, was the ratio of cash and investments to deferred revenues in the general fund greater than or equal to <clears throat> one to one? The answer is yes. Number 15, was the administrative cost ratio less than the standard in state law? <clears throat> TEA and state law sets a cap on the percentage of their budget that Texas school districts can spend on administration. Did we stay within the cap for districts of our size? Uh, districts our size, the law is a ratio of 0 0.1105, and our ratio is Number 16, was the ratio of students to teachers in the ranges shown below according to district size for a population equal to or greater than 10,000, the ratio is a low of 13.5 and a high of 22, and our ratio was 16.6. Number 17, was the ratio of students to total staff within the ranges shown below for a district equal to or greater than 10,000, the range is a low of seven and a high of 14? And our answer was yes. Our, our ratio was eight and seven, nine, six. Number 18, was the decrease in undesignated fund balance less than 20% over the two fiscal years? We had no decrease. Number 19, was the aggregate total cash and investments in the general fund more than zero? Yes, we had $115,112,868 cash and investment. And 20 were in investment earnings in all funds, excluding debt service and capital projects. Did they meet or exceed the three-month Treasury bill rate? <coughs> now some further disclosures that we have for our financial management report. The first, we're required to disclose re reimbursements received uh, by the superintendent and board members. Uh, these reimbursements include meals, lodging, transportation, motor fuel, other. As we as we can see, Dr. Stockton uh, had reimbursements of $1,381.99. Mr. Mel Brown had reimbursements of $630.15. Ms. Linda Sasser, $412.75. And Mr. Joe Michaels, $212.85. The next uh, I'm show is the outside compensation and or fees received by the superintendent for professional concert consulting and or personal services. There was no, no compensation. The next uh, disclosure is any gifts received by the executive officers and board members or any first degree relatives. And this is gifts that are in excess of $250. As you can see, there was no gifts received. Next disclosure is any business transactions between the school district and any board members. And there was a uh, business with Mr. John Husbands of $768,138.50. But I would like to say that this above amount reflects normal business transactions between Conroe ISD and the employers of Mr. Husbands, which is Souls Insurance. Uh, Mr. Husbands received no commissions for these revenues. His relationship predates this membership, his membership on the board of directors. Uh, we're required to show the first quarter of expenditures, 2012-2013 uh, year by object code. <clears throat> so if we look at our expenditures for our payroll for that quarter, $65,928,598. Contracted services, $8,944,960. Supplies and materials, $5,252,851. Other operating, $2,191,894.06. No debt service payments, a capital outlay of $605,107.90. Additional financial solvency questions. Uh, within the last two years, did the school district draw funds from short-term financing, no. Answer is no. For the prior fiscal year, have a total. For the prior fiscal year, did the general fund have a have a fund balance less than two percent of total expenditures? Answer is no. Question number two: 
Has the school district declared financial extendency in the past two years? No. Third question. How many superintendents has your school district had in the last five years? One. And number four, how many business managers has your school district had in the last five years? Another disclosure we're required to, to have is the uh, superintendent's contract. I'm not going to read the full contract for you, but if you're interested in that, I have handouts here. And this, and this presentation is also posted on the uh, finance website for CISD. All right, thank you, Mr. Rice. If anybody has any comments, if you'll please come to the podium and state your name and, and keep your comments to two minutes. Any takers? I was assuming you all showed up for the first presentation, but I guess I was wrong. <laughs> all right, thank you, Mr. Rice. Mr. Sanders, we're completing the, the uh, public hearing. Uh, as we start, you know, we're thankful for our school district. We just want to uh, acknowledge that with a round of applause for our great school district. <laughs> uh, thank you for all the hard work. All right, I uh, call this meeting of the Conroe Independent School District Board of Trustees to order. Let the record show that a quorum of members is present, that this meeting has been duly called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. The time is now 612. If you would please stand with me as Dr. Brown leads us in the invitation, Ms. Haynes and our pledges. Let's pray. Our most gracious God, uh, thank you for all you do to enrich our lives. Help us to always be, re always remember to be great for all your gifts. Keep us ever mindful uh, that we need to use those gifts to serve you and our And the matters that come before this board keep us uh, mindful of our responsibilities to students, faculty, to administration, and to the taxpayer. Remind us that while we need to work in harmony, that we need to work in harmony even when we're not in unison. When we di disagree, let us do so agreeably. Let us be transparent, not only with each other, but with the public in everything that we do. We pray uh, your watch, for your watch care over those who serve in the armed forces and who protect the freedoms we so richly enjoy in this country. Help us not to abuse uh, the freedoms. These things we humbly pray. Amen. Please join me in honoring our country and our state. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now our state. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God. One and individual. You may be seated. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. <clears throat> Item 2A, Awards and Recognition, Special District Recognition, Conroe ISD, National Merit Scholarship Student Recognitions. Dr. Stockton. All right, Mrs. Drummond, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Secondary Education, will come and present this item. Good evening, President Sanders, Dr. Stockton, and members of the board. It is an honor for me to be here this evening to give, for all of us, to give special recognition to all of these students for their academic achievements. The National Merit Scholarship Program is an academic competition for recognition and scholarships that began in 1955. High school students enter the National Merit Program by taking the preliminary SAT, better known as PSAT, the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test, which serves as an initial screening of approximately 1.5 million entrants. Around 50,000 students with the highest 
PSAT and MSQT selection index scores will qualify for recognition in the National Merit Scholarship Program. In early September, about 16,000 students, or approximately one-third of the 50,000 high scorers, are notified that they have qualified as semifinalists. To ensure that academically able young people from all parts of the United States are included in this talent pool, semifinalists are designated on a state representational basis. They are the highest scoring entrants in each state. In February 2013, approximately 15,000 semifinalists will be notified by mail that they have advanced to finalist level. We also are recognizing National Hispanic Recognition Program. This identifies academically outstanding Hispanic Latino high school students. Each year, the NHRP honors nearly 5,000 of the highest scoring students from approximately 235,000 Hispanic Latino juniors who take the PSAT and MSQT. And the National Achievement Scholarship Program is an academic competition established in 1964 to provide recognition for outstanding African-American high school students. <laughs> African-American students may enter both the National Achievement Program and the National Merit Program by taking the PSAT and MSQT. Of more than 160,000 students to enter the National Achievement Program each year, over 4,700 are honored. A group of approximately 3,000 100 outstanding participants are referred to colleges for their potential for academic success. A smaller group of about 1,600 are named semifinalists and have the opportunity to advance in the scholarship competition. Before I recognize these students, I would like to recognize their principals. And I think they're all in the back of the room. Dr. Curtis Nall from Conroe High School. <laughs> Mr. Tommy Johnson from Oak Ridge High School. <laughs> Mr. Greg Colshin from the Woodlands High School. <laughs> Dr. Mark Merle from the Woodlands College Park High School. Our Academy Headmasters, Dr. Mike Papadimitrio from the Academy of Science and Technology. And Dr. Susan Caffrey from the Academy of Science and Technology. <laughs> Students, when I call your name, if you will come forward, Mr. Datron Williams will give you a certificate, and then you're going to stay up front so that everybody can see your lovely faces, okay? And at the end, parents be ready because we want to recognize you as well. Our National Merit semifinalists for 2013-14, Anastasia Alisenko. Austin Bay. David Beckman. John Beats. Imran Bell. Patrick Berry. Catherine Castagna. Keen Chin. Rebecca Curtis.
Kyle Dugan. Andrew Gomez. Elizabeth Harper. Zachary Ireland. Bjorn Johnson. Monacy Joshi. Robert Karens. Christopher Kessinger. William Quo. Scott Mayberry. Haley Nelson. Tien Nguyen. Humphrey Ubobi. Lubin Popov. Gibran Rahman. Rita Sanka. Liam Tobin. Sydney Balansky. Chester Wang. Catherine Yu. Eric Yu. Karina Yu. William Zitterick. And parents of these National Merit semifinalists, would you please stand? Ladies and gentlemen, we want to congratulate you on your outstanding performance academically. We know that you are excited about your next steps. So congratulations to you. Please join me in, in recognizing these ladies and gentlemen. get to shake the hands of all the board members. So we're going to start on this end. Wow. You guys come out this way wow. and you're going to circle Maybe around. Circle. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Congratulations. 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 Congratul
I think maybe the smart thing would be to watch. Okay, our next we're now going to recognize our students who are recipients of the National Hispanic Recognition Program. Ms. Drummond, good morning. And Dr. Meeks is going to make sure she checks with the students outside in the photo op to make sure they come back if they're on the second list oh, yeah. as well. Okay, our recipients in the National Hispanic Recognition Program are Jack Agron, yeah. Miriam Banuelas, Elena Crouch. Eric Cruz, Roberto Daly, Alexandra Dewey, Michaela Baya. Catalina Fernandez Mores, Andrew Gomez, Arumi Harakawa, Alexa Killian. William Quo, <laughs> Riley Martinez, <laughs> Rodrigo Mendoza, <laughs> Nicolas Morales. Kelly Porras, <laughs> Alexander Quinn, <laughs> Anwar Praya Rodriguez, <laughs> Greta Saldivar. Lily Schaefer. David Siller. Robert Simpson. Jonathan Terpstra. Haley Treber. Joseph Valencia. And Derek Wagoner. William Quo.
And would the parents of these young scholars please stand and let us recognize you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. You're on the road. <laughs> You're ready. Please join me in recognizing these young people for their <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Congratulations, John. Congratulations. West Point. Okay, and we have our last group, or our semifinalist in the National Achievement Scholarship Program, Michaela Bankston. <laughs> Tristan Newman. Humphrey Boo Bobby Congratulations I think I might be missing one student, Keen Chen. He's not here? Okay. Would the parents of these two young scholars please stand? Thank you very much. Congratulations. You can shake the hands on the board. Congratulations, I'm proud of you. Congratulations to you. Congratulations. I know. I'm having speech. All right, the next item on our agenda is item 2B, citizens participation. Ms. Ferris, has anyone registered to address the board? All right. The next 30 minutes have been designated for public participation by patrons who have signed up to address the board in accordance with board policy BED. Please remember that the board may not discuss or act upon any issues that are not posted on our agenda. The board has adopted a complaint policies that are designed to secure at the lowest administrative level a prompt and equitable resolution of complaints and concerns. 
These policies provide that if a resolution cannot be reached administratively, the person may appeal the administrative decision to the board as a properly posted agenda item. Copies of the district's complaint policies can be found on the district's website. Those who have registered to address the board will be limited to five minutes for their presentation. Delegations that represent five or more must appoint one representative to present their views to the board. Ms. Ferris, please call the first person who has signed up to address the board. I can Jamie Metter. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to visit with you today. Before I get started, I want to tell you what a great respect and admiration I've always had for school board members. Um, I know you don't do it for the pay. I know you don't do it for the recognition. You do it because you have a passion to make things better for our children, our school districts, and our county. I work for Montgomery County. One of our one of our big things that we try to dwell upon is economic development. The sharpest tool in our toolbox is our school districts. And thanks to you guys and ladies, uh, what you do provides us with the tool that we need to attract economic development. Thank you for your service. Um, my name is Mike Metter, and I'm here uh, tonight, as, I guess an outsider, I'm not a Conroe, Graduate, I, I went to school in Willis, Texas, 100 years ago. Um, about three years ago, I had an opportunity to speak to the teaching staff. And one of the things I talked to them about is, is the impact that my teachers had on me when I was going to elementary school, junior high, and high school. Um, they have an effect on us, even to this day, how we, uh, how we run our life how we do our business. The, the teachers that we had taught us work ethics, character, discipline, honesty, respect, how to be a good winner, how to be a good loser, when to hold them and when to fold them sometime. In other words, because of our teachers, we pretty much are who we are. Uh, even after all these years, I've got in Willis, there are schools named after people that, that taught me, that coached me, that paddled me. Most of them did. <laughs> um, almost all of them did, I think, that's got their name on these schools. But um, it had an effect. Uh, it, it helped guide me through my life. Uh, and I know school districts struggle and struggle with naming schools. And I know there's, there's different ways to do it. There's selection committees. Uh, in this case, I think the school board's going to vote. They're going to name school. Uh, my wife and I are very honored to have had elementary schools named after uh, Hauser Elementary, after my wife's dad, Metter Elementary, and Willis School District. And what an honor it was for our family. I mean, it was, it was just a, a tremendous day for us. And, and I'm thankful that they were alive to see that their service was recognized. All the years that they served the school district, it was recognized by people. Um, soon, soon you have an opportunity to honor a great educator. That's a Conroe School District educator, um, Janet K. Bartlett, has spent 30 years of her life dedicated to teaching our children, molding them, shaping them, uh, guiding them through life. Uh, she, her, her work ethics and her dedication to teaching, her, her passion is, is legendary. I'm here tonight to urge you to give all of our educators hope that someday they too can be recognized for the service that they put in for our school districts, uh, teaching our kids life lessons. Uh, and I, I, I would ask you, to consider naming one of your elementary schools, Janet K. Bartlett Elementary. Uh, and I thank you for your time. That's a hard act to follow. 
Anyway, I'm Janie Hauser Metter, and I'm a retired uh, school teacher, 20 years with CISD, and I am proud of that. Uh, it's an honor to stand before you tonight and talk about my friend Janet Bartlett. In this audience tonight is a group of CISD students that started kindergarten here. We went all through junior high, uh, high school, uh, graduated from Conroe High School, went to college, and we all came back. Some of our parents went to the Conroe Independent School District. Our children went to Conroe St Independent School District, and now some of our grandchildren are going. And that's a neat thing. And uh, among our group, we were football players, we were cheerleaders, we were drill team, we were track team, we were debate team. And we talked about wearing our uniforms and our jackets, but then we remembered they don't fit us anymore. <laughs> okay, I want to talk first about some things that Janet and I have talked about and the rest of the group is when we went to Sam Houston Elementary and to Anderson Elementary, how when we still go back there, we can still smell the milk and crackers. There's just something about those buildings that reminds you of that. And then when we go over to Travis and Conroe High School, we think about all the roaring of the pep rallies and the wonderful teachers that we had while we were there and the wonderful experiences. And at Sam Houston, we learned, we were so proud, we learned to read, we learned to write, especially in cursive, that was the most wonderful thing. And then we also got to do uh, arithmetic. We didn't do math, we did arithmetic. Two goes into two goes into two. <laughs> and we call it goes into instead of goes into. But anyway, we think about Dick and Jane and we think about Spot and Puff and what happened to all that. Now we try to help our grandchildren with their homework and oh my gosh, it's like they're doing algebra where we were doing goes into. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I remember distinctly that I got a whipping in the third grade for talking. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and I can guarantee you that Janet Bartlett never got a whipping. <laughs> okay, we represent old Conroe and we used to talk about the older people, uh, some of our school board members' parents. Anyway, Harold Pryor, J.L. McCullough, Mr. Montgomery, we talked and talked about the older people. Well, what scares us now is we are the older people. That's really scary. But anyway, the words to stand for gold in the white and love our song, Tiger Boogie, those things will forever be with us. And our group tonight represents teachers, administrators. Uh, I'd like to introduce or recognize Ms. Bonnie Wilkinson. Everybody, she's our hero and everybody loves her. <laughs> anyway, we have principals, I see Drew in. We're represented by librarians, Patty, Beverly. We've just got a whole group of people here that are so proud to, to put Janet Bartlett's name before you. And we even let our mayor, who was a Montgomery bear, Webb Melder, we let him come. <laughs> and then my husband, county commissioner, he was a Willis Wildcat, but we still let him come too. And uh, we just want to say how very proud we are to nominate Janet Bartlett and would love to have a North County Elementary School named after her. Thank you. Thank you. Did, okay. Item three is our consent agenda. I believe it's already been handed out. I so I got, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, signify by the raised hand. Motion carries. Opposed? Right. Item 4A, Curriculum and Instruction, Texas Accountability Summary, SAT, ACT, Advanced Placement, Telpass. Results for 2013, Dr. Stockton. Dr. Hines, we're excited about your report tonight, as we always are. Good evening, President Sanders, members of the board, Dr. Stockton. It is certainly an honor to uh, present to you our uh, 2013 State Accountability, our TELPASS, SAT, ACT, Advanced Placement, Dual Credit, and everything else we can throw into it. Um, and I do want to acknowledge a few people uh, that are here tonight that helped with this. Uh, 
compiling this data. Uh, Edith Upshaw, is she still here? There's Edith. She's our Director of Curriculum and Instruction. Also here tonight, uh, Sherry Sunderman is here. Sherry. Uh, Why don't you all stand up? Yeah, stand up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Kelly is here, our Coordinator of Assessment and Evaluation. Also for instructional materials, which you would just approve the committee for tonight. Uh, we also have Ima Villarreal, who's our uh, college readiness specialist. She works with dual credit. Uh, she's also the person behind who sets up our uh, our test boot camps. We just had one for parents uh, last week. It was a very great success. Also, Debbie McNeely's here tonight, our uh, secondary language arts and advanced placement coordinator. Um, uh, Greg Ship is here from Career and Technology. You recognize. Mr. Ship last month when he was the uh, outstanding administrator in Texas in that area. Uh, so the, all these folks worked really hard. I also want to acknowledge Tammy Zunkers here because you just approved the Instructional Materials Committee. And also on the on the agenda was the SHAC Committee. And here is uh, Dr. Sharon Sturcher, who we recognized during the summer, outstanding, is also here this evening. So we have... And Cheryl Heim is here because we had science curriculum hey. on the uh, <laughs> Oh, and, and uh, I almost forgot, we're going to hit the Telpass scores. And uh, Darren Carlisle is our uh, bilingual ESL uh, coordinator, and she's here with us tonight. So I think we got all the <laughs> and, and it's truly my privilege and honor to work with such an outstanding team. We have a great uh, CNI team, and they do lots of good stuff. And you'll, you'll hear about a lot of it this evening as we go through this. Um, let me start with TELPASS. Uh, that is part of the No Child Left Behind accountability system. It's for our English language learners. And, and what this is, is this requires states to show annual increase in the progress of learning English and attaining proficiency, and not just in English, but also in the English used in academic courses. Um, and so the goal is in Texas to move up at least one proficiency level each year. Uh, you're going to, one of the things we talk about we're measuring is ELPS, which are the instructional standards that are designed to ensure that students are taught academic English that they need for school purposes. And TELPASS is the required assessment that we use to measure this progress. And TELPASS raters are our teachers that are trained to assess our English language learners for the TELPASS. They're, one of the reasons it has to be trained is because not everything is a paper and pencil test. There's There are four language domains that are being uh, assessed, listening, speaking, reading, and writing, and there are four proficiency levels, beginning, intermediate, advanced, and advanced high. And we do this with all of our students that are English language learners in grades kindergarten through grades 12. So it's a lot of, a lot of students. And I won't read these to you, but there are uh, proficiency levels, and you can see everything from beginning with little or no English ability with our, our recent arrivals to advanced high, which are grade appropriate. Who takes uh, TELPASS, I just mentioned that, it's all of our English language learners in uh, kindergarten through 12th grade, regardless of whether they receive services. So if a parent denies bilingual services and just wants their child immersed, we still would assess the progress of that student. For students in grades th uh, 2 through 12, they're able to use an online multiple choice test for reading. Uh, obviously, for kindergarten and first grade, we use a holistic rating scoring process. And for all the K through 12, it's holistically scored for listening, speaking, and writing. And this is a summary of how we've done. This is just a, a look back at five years. And you can see that the goal, especially as the student's been in the program longer, the goal is to uh, move from beginning to advanced high and, and then, of course, exit our program and no longer be uh, an English language learner. And so we look at that. One of the things we lo really look at is that as students are getting into that second, third, fourth grade, are we moving them on and exiting? And, and you can see we've made great progress, and we continue over the last several years to uh, move students. So just for example, if you'll look at uh, 2013, in third grade, 54% 54, uh, 54 of our students scored advanced high. And uh, in 2009, it was 50%. So we've moved up in that area. Fourth grade. <laughs> 54% uh, also compared to 51% last year. Uh, so it's been up and down to 50% back in 2009. So we've really tried to work on this and we've shown some steady progress and a lot of success in moving our students. Uh, and this is our five-year trend. I wanted to show that to you this evening. 
shifting gears, and, and really this is kind of a three-part presentation this evening. That was the first part of TELPASS. The, the second one is uh, to share with you how we did in the accountability system, which is Texas has a new accountability system uh, called the Texas Accountability System. It's a really interesting name. Uh, and I will try my best not to confuse you. We, we, we joke about the fact that there's uh, they had lots of objectives in this new system trying to tweak some of the limitations in the prior system um, that people would complain about that one child could, could be the difference in a whole rating. So they tried to, 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 to really diversify the rating system. However, in doing so, um, and one of the other goals was to make it easier to understand. But I think they accomplished some of the others. I'm not sure they made it easier to understand. But, but it is more comprehensive than the prior system. So it covers a lot of things. Uh, the, the, for this year, for the short of it is, there's accountability rating and there's three levels. You would either meet standard, meet an alternative standard for an alternative school, such as Hawk would be under that system. And then the other one is if you don't do well, you would get the label improvement required. Um, and so that is the, the ratings that were issued this year. Uh, in addition, there were three distinction categories that campuses could earn. So not the district level, but campuses. So they also had a place where they could get recognition for doing very well in some categories. And they're based on uh, performing in the top 25% of student progress so that of the comparison schools. And all of these, these distinctions are based on taking campuses and grouping them with like campuses and saying, how did you do against schools like you? If you're in the top, the top quartile, uh, I mean, in the top 25%, that's one of the distinctions. The other one is being recognized for academic achievement and um, uh, math and in reading. So those are the different recognitions. So this is our the district's accountability rating that we received this year. And you can see that we met standard. Um, and we uh, these are the, the, the progress that we made in the four indices. There's four, there's four indices, and I'll, I'll try to go through each of the four and explain what they mean. And this is the first year of this system. In fact, we had already taken the test before we even received the system, and it really wasn't until just recently that we actually received this information. Uh, and you can see there how it scored. So we did meet the standard. We were scored in four indices. In addition, there's some system safeguards I'll mention in a little bit. We'll start with index one. Index one is really the easiest one to understand. It's how many tests were taken and how many did you pass? It's just a, it's just a raw score. You know, it's based on we're going to add up all the tests and how many did you pass, and that's your score. And, and the score was set at there's a phase-in standard that they'll move through at what we call level two phase-in standard, and that's how they, they uh, assess this index. And here's how we did. Uh, 86 was our score. To meet standard, we had to have at least 50, a score of 50. Uh, and th we wanted to give you a context. So how did the state do? 77 was the state score overall. So uh, just to give you a context. Dr. Hines, do you anticipate that, that target score will move, or is it always set? No, I think that will go up over time as the state gets a feel for what's acceptable. One of the things they're looking at is kind of that scatter plot of where does everybody fall? And I think they're going to eventually start saying down here, it's not good. Whatever that, that mark is. That scatter so plot. They, it may, okay. The line may change. In fact, a lot of these index standards may change over time as they learn more about it and as we learn the system. One last question. Is there 86, 70, 76, is it percent of 100? In, in this I case, mean, of 100, there's 100 of 100 percent of the tests taken, we passed 86 percent of them. Right. Does that make sense? That's pretty easy to understand. They won't. Well, get yeah, sometimes those, those percentages, they're, they're not percentages though. So uh, right, that's right. what I thought about that. And, 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 and you're right. And when we get in these other indexes, they're not percent. Earn points by how you perform in a category. And some of our students count more than once in these other indexes. So they they can they count multiple times. Or they cannot count multiple times. They can show up in your denominator more than once, or they can show up in your numerator and your denominator. So the idea is you get points for students. Index two is student progress, and this is this is an index that measures pretty much it's set to measure value added. 
how much did you grow a student? So a, a child can get credit for meeting a growth expectation, still failing the test. If I moved them from a 40 to a 60, that's pretty good, and maybe I got a point for moving them that far, but I didn't get credit for passing on the index one, but I could get credit in index two. In addition, they give you credit for exceeding expected growth. Uh, it, you exceed. One point for meeting it, two points for exceeding it, um, and it's a it's based on a weighted performance. So here's how we did. Uh, we had a 38 score, put that in perspective. Texas had a 34. As a district, we had to have at least 21 or we were going to be a improvement required district. So we exceeded that. Um, this is one that we really want to work on because we believe if we move everybody and we keep adding value, all the others will go up. And the other. Sorry, our, district, excuse me. Go ahead. our district had the goal of improving adding value for a long time, much more so than any given score of any test. But how, how since we didn't have a test last year equivalent yet, yeah, how are they measuring? Uh, well, that's Did they take thing. a benchmark at the first of the year well, or something? They, I, I'm, I'm just... We didn't get tests for the prior year. They just didn't issue a rating. Okay, so this is the second, the second year. Second year of the test. We didn't know what passing was last year. We did have a standard. The there was a standard set for the child. Now, the one of, there, the there's a lot of complications, this, and I will try not to bog you down with all of them, but one of the complications is you had to have taken the prior year test in the same format. And, and one of the things we found out was that students who, for example, took the Spanish version in third grade but exited it, took it in English in fourth grade, didn't count because they didn't have an apple-to-apple -apple comparison. Uh, they, they don't assess in science or social studies because they don't have a prior year test. They're tested on a less frequent basis. So this is really reading, math, and seventh grade writing that, that <coughs> counted in this, uh, I guess EOCs incorporated in this for the high school. So it's, it's fewer tests, and if a student changed tests, went from a star M version to a star regular version, they didn't know how to convert that so that you didn't score count. There were a lot of students that were left out of this index. So that's index two. Moving to index three. This one is uh, an index for closing the performance gap. In this one, the, the state was trying to look at how do you do with your flagging group, students that are behind. So what this is based on is on each campus <coughs> at the district level, we're looking at all of our students that fall in the category of being economically disadvantaged, and then our two lowest groups based on ethnicity. Take those groups, those three groups, and make up your index three score. And it's very similar in that there's going to be a point earned for students that met the phase in level, and you get two points if you meet the level three score. Level three is, uh, for lack of a better word, in the old system they called it commended. It's scoring really high on it. You get level three, you get two points, one point for passing. And it's done by subject, and it's done for socioeconomic identified students as well as the two lowest groups for a campus or the district overall. And so that may vary from campus to campus based on the school's makeup. So for index three, I don't know if school district had a 78 score, put that in perspective, Texas had a 71. And to not be improvement required, we had to have it 55 or above. That was the cutoff. So that's what the yellow line represents. So that was index three. That's the index for closing the Index four is for post-secondary readiness. This is the index that's designed to look at how are you doing moving kids to the high end. And this one is going to calculate a score based on graduation rates. And really, this year, that's all they use is graduation. Um, that's, they didn't use the level three, but, but I'm going to talk about what's going to come into play this year. Index four is going to change, and so will the benchmark level, it will change. So this year all they used was graduation. As you know, we have a very high completion rate in our district, and so we did well on this index. Uh, but it will change next year, and it will include also um, the students by groups, um, so meaning a student would count 
as all students, and then they count again based on their ethnicity for the recommended plans for the Distinguished Achievement graduation plan. And then also for our STAR scores, and that is based on the final level two standard, which I know is going to confuse you, not at the final standard, but where they deem we should be uh, on one or more tests for all students. And that one also is calculated by all and by ethnicity. So that's the post-secondary readiness. But again, this year it was just based on graduation. So uh, we did very well. We had a 91 for our score. The target was the 75. Put it in comparison, Texas had an 85. So uh, we did well on this. The next year, this index will calculate different, and there will be a different target score based on the state runs for number. The calculation they base it on meeting the recommended plan or stated as distinguished plan. Yes, and some modified plan. Those two plans, as well as how many students are going to hit the final level two, which we know what that standard is, and, uh, and or above. So we can calculate that now. Our our schools are already starting to look at that. We've been out and visiting with them. They, they can kind of know, like, of course, it was last year's students, but they could say, based on last year, we would have had this. We've got to move students. And, and we're looking at that. How do you take a student and you see that they're two questions right from being past that threshold. So how do I help add value to those students so that they can move, keep pushing them to the right, adding value, and get more students into that higher level of performance? That's our goal. Um, ultimately, is that is a an index to score that. So we see we did pretty well, but the game's going to change next year on the next one. System safeguards, I mentioned those, that uh, this basically was the system the state put in to cover all the things that are required in NCLB, which is there's a safeguard for every student group for every test. It's, you know, it's a total number of uh, tests that we had and, and, and we had to meet. Target, again, um, is based on you have to meet a minimum standard. We had, um, I believe, what was our 90? 3%, 94% for safeguards, safeguards, participation. So you had to meet at least 50 and at least 95. And then 78 for the graduation rates. We, so these are the different areas we're held accountable for. Then the, the distinctions, I mentioned those a little bit already. There's three possible designations. These are for campuses only. And the way, this is, the way this works is it lists all these indicators. And if you're in elementary school, the ones that apply to you, you have to be in the top uh, quartile for half of them. If you do that, you get a recognition. And I'm going to show you what it looks like. And for a high school, it's a third of them. There's a lot more for high school. So for uh, I'll give you the example for student progress. It's campus only. It's based on the MET standard rating. Um, Campuses in the top 25 percent. Their campus comparison groups from academic achievement distinction designation. So this is an example. This is Grangerland Intermediate School. This is their list of 40 schools. They're grouped based on their likeness with other schools, based on size, mobility, the size of their uh, limited English proficient population, and ecodis. Those are the four categories that they use to group everybody together. So here are the 40 campuses, for example, that Grangerland was compared with. And they they received a distinction in student progress. Their index two score was a 42. And you can see how it compared to the other schools in their group of 40. But the bottom being 29, the highest being 51. But that put them in the top quarter that earned them a distinction. See how the distinctions work? So it's based on somewhat of a competitive model of what did you do against schools like you. Now they have a distinction also for progress in English language arts, and I won't read them all to you, but these are the categories. I will point out that attendance is part of both reading and math performance. You're going to see that. And one of the things we learned as we went out and looked at the data is that sometimes the difference between being in the top quartile and the bottom quartile is like 0.3. The schools are real close. The top one might be 97.5% of 
bottom might be 96. Not a lot of separation in there. Uh, but it is something we're working on because every absence counts. counts. That close, really, really starting to take a look at that. How can we improve intended? Uh, so these are the indicators. And you can see uh, that several of these, for example, like APIB number seven, number eight, number nine, number 10, number 11, are high school only. So the high school have more indicators. That's why they only have to be in the top quartile for a third of them. As opposed to that. AP, I got ID. That we don't have an ID. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what does it stand for? The International Baccalaureate. Oh. So this is an example for Rice Elementary. What they're just, and you can see the cues, the quartile, how they did. They had a 97%, this is a good example. They had 97% attendance and it was in the second quartile. Um, but they, they also were in the first quartile for better than expected progress in English language arts and also for writing performance. So they were, they had 50% or more that were in the top quartile got the distinction. They have one just like that for math. Looks very similar. Let's change it out for math. And they added Algebra 1 participation in performance. We do very well in performance. We're going to increase our Excuse me. If you're distinguished, Vice has got the distinction. Is that if you get it for math, if you got it, period? Or is it if you get it for math, you get it for? It's There's three different ones you can get. Three okay, progress, I'm just, math, and reading. The so one doesn't qualify you for the distinction. It just qualifies you for that distinction. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. The distinction I'm, stands alone. Yeah, they understand. got it. They get it. They have one. You could get one, two, three, or none. Correct. We had we had thirty campuses that received one or more distinct. Sure, you said that. I'm just kidding. It's okay. I apologize. It is. It'll, it is new. We're still. We're still. We're still. We'll still run. Uh, find something new every day. We'll think. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, and this is an example of math. And this is the Woodlands. And you can see for a high school, they had more things rated on. <laughs> So they had to be in the top quartile for at least a third of them. If there are seven, but they hit three of seven, which is at least a third. So they received the distinction earned math for greater than expected progress for SAT participation and for SAT performance. So those three put them in the top quartile. So those are the distinctions. That's what they look like. And uh, any questions about accountability or the new system before I move on. Yeah, can you back up to that this survey screen? This is a quick question. Uh, we take great pride in the amount of AP and dual credit courses, not only that we offer, but the amount of tests that are taken. Does the does it just so happen that the amount of tests taken count against us if they don't pass? So the more tests we take, the more preparation they have for college level, uh, you know, whether they pass the test or not, what, why would the Woodlands be at 27% on AP dual credit course completion? That, that just blows my mind because we know how much they do. Well, I mean, not just the, our, all our high schools. This just says completion. That doesn't say. Right. There's two different, there's, there's two marks there. One is how many are for doing it and how well did you do? So what this one is saying is, hey, for the participation, and, and, and remember, it's in their like group. How did they compare to their 40 schools? And 27% participation did not, didn't put them in the bottom half of their 40. That's the schools thing. just like them, Highland Park, Plano. Austin West Lake, big, big. Big, big league, but I mean, that's. Yeah, that's what, you know, I was going to make this comment later, but <clears throat> the comparable 40s are, are really a motivation for campuses because they're looked at um, with like schools. So I, something like this, we'd assume is very high. Look at schools just like them. That's an area we want to prove. <clears throat> yeah, it, it does. It raises a lot of those discussions about our, what are our systems, what are our barriers, do we put up obstacles? <laughs> We limit, we discourage people from taking more, those kinds of things. Those questions should come up when you look at your data because like schools are beating us. So um, this is something that we all look at and try to learn from. But they did they did they did well overall and they got a distinction in math. Okay.
Okay, so if everybody's okay, I'm going to change to the third gear, which is. Um, so you understand the accountability system now? Did I say anything wrong, William? But I the need board to doesn't have to take a chance for us to stay recognized. Today, <laughs> something like that. No, and and uh, William's been doing a great job of going around and doing presentations that he could try to help our staff better familiar with this. And it'll take a little bit of time. Just giving a few highlights on our college readiness portion of this report. And uh, again, I want to acknowledge everybody who helped put this report together. Uh, and IMA really did a lot of work coordinating the whole report for us. Um, turned, out, turned out real well. So I'll hit the highlights. I know uh, I've taken up a lot of time already. The, that we had 32 national merit semifinalists in 2013. We're proud of that. 26 Hispanic recognition scholars, four national achievement scholars, and 71 national merit commended students that we couldn't have fit in the room tonight. Um, but a lot, a lot of students that we're excited about how they did. 7.31% um, of our graduating seniors graduated under the distinct <laughs> achievement plan. So that has the four advanced measures like being a national merit student, a certain number of AP courses, uh, as well as a third year foreign language. We had 1,302 uh, seniors that took the AC and with ACT with a composite score of 23.3, which was an increase for us. We had 3,324 students that took 7,588 AP exams. Uh, CISD has, no, this is something that, there was an article I think that ran recently about this. We also had the Texas AP scholar. The state. The number one AP student in the state was a Woodlands High School graduate, Timothy Nicebold. He took 25 total exams, some of which were courses he didn't even take while he was in high school. He scored a five, which is the highest you can make, on 23 of those tests and a four on the other two. He had a 4.92 average, and he told his mom that when he, when he went to college, they gave him 137 credits. Isn't it 120 to graduate? <laughs> so, we still have some well, I mean, I had to take a few extras. I read, I read the note from the mom, and, and, and basically he said that uh, he was being, he's studying to be an engineer, and so a lot of them they didn't even take towards his degree plan, but he still got elective credits. So this is good stuff. It's good stuff on the good stuff. <clears throat> It's pretty exciting. So this is, a, this is our trend over the last few years with National Merit students. And again, we're really working on that, trying to maximize that number. feel like we can even go up more. And I know a lot of the programs out there to raise awareness, such as the Best Prep Boot Camp, and really getting more students into more rigorous courses. This is our graduation continuous GED and dropout summary. As you know, out of 100%, the state kind of puts them into four categories. In, when did, did they graduate with their co cohort four years later? We had, had 95.5% compared to the state's 87.7% for the class of 2012. Did they continue, meaning did they stay for a fifth year? And, and, and even though we don't have great success graduating fifth year students, is, you know, my point is that if they're not enrolled, there's no chance to want them enrolled. They didn't graduate. We had 1% receive the GED and 1.5% that dropped out were unaccounted for compared to 6.3% at the state level. So we've really continued to work really hard in this area. We have, it's an ongoing challenge we have work to do. This is our 11 year graduation trend. You see, take a look at it. Uh, in 2002, we were at 88.2% and uh, 2012, we were at 95.5%. We're proud of that, that we've been able to, to just chip away at it and keep working. We still have work to do. Our goal is 100%, but uh, but we're making progress we're going in the right direction. Isn't it true, you know, you count up the 98.5% that graduated in some form or fashion, okay, and that leaves 1.5%. They didn't, I mean, don't we lose track of some of them? I mean, in other words, I've heard about us chasing kids down, not necessarily for graduation, but just to get them off of our books, you got to prove they went to school somewhere else, even in another country, right? Correct. And uh, so it's not like less than one and a half percent kids, period. I mean, some drop out. I mean, I got that. But one and a half percent of them, not necessarily all of them, we, we might have lost, lost track of them. 
Yeah, we've had we've had better luck. We've gotten better at finding kids over the years, but certainly that we still have those that just disappear, uh, especially if they don't want to be found or if they've moved out of country and just don't know it. If we had reason, if good intelligence that they moved, we can document that. We just can't say, I think they did. We have to be able to prove it. We have to at least have some something to report that I talked to the uncle who confirmed it or the grandparents confirmed it to her to get proof that they moved. Sometimes they don't tell us. So if we had 4,000 graduates we're talking about 60 percent and a half, and, and how many of those are literal dropout that we know? I mean, I know they all are as far as you understand what I'm asking. Yeah, I, you know, I don't have a good answer. I would say I would say the majority, right. but I don't have a percent. I think it's going to vary from year to year too, depending on the students in the in the cohort. Uh, there are different different reasons or different things that come up. And I will I will point out that they do detract uh, or subtract from our set if a student is in prison or jail. Uh, they'll take them out of our our list, so they don't count. They do lose a uh, that are subtracted. Oh, let me go back. This is our percentage of graduation plans. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, the blue part at the bottom represents our distinguished achievement graduates. The red is our recommended plan graduates. And the green represents our um, uh, minimum plan graduates, which is changing. All this is going away. And next year, we'll probably, or later this year, we'll have to adopt new policies about graduation plans. So. They all have new names, so get recommended that and then on they'll come up with new names. Uh, won't, won't go into that tonight, but we'll be back to talk about graduation plan later this year. As you can see the trend is very positive. Captured a bigger market share of advanced program uh, of diploma. But we can do better. Better. <clears throat> SAT performance, just to give you a quick look. Uh, CISD is in the green bar. And this is critical reading math and writing scores. And you can see we outperformed the national average as well as the Texas average in all three tests. Certainly proud of that, but we want to keep working on it. So we had 521 in critical reading, 540 in math, 501 in writing. Our uh, composite was 1562 compared to Texas's 1437 and the nation's 1498. And this is our trend, how we've done reading and math. We have several years of data. Writing has been around now about seven years, so we're starting to get lots of data on that. As you can see, it's been up and down, but generally we're trending positive. Uh, the national level has actually started to uh, really flatline, and states uh, actually declined a little bit as it's increased the percentage. And we've increased the percentage of test takers as well. Our goal is to keep increasing the number of test takers, but to not decline in our scores. This is a trend Look at our trend in the number of students tested in the SAT, and it's been very positive. We tested 2,109 students last year. The ACT, this is just a quick look at how we did. Again, we're in the green, and uh, ACT covers English, math, reading, science, and then there's a composite score. Uh, and you can see that uh, did very well compared to the nation and Texas averages. From the ACT scores, they'll, they'll pull a minimum score, and the ACT says, hey, there's a pretty good chance a student's going to pass the class in college based on these scores. And this is the, the, the chart that shows the percentage of our test takers that met that standard in all the tests. Now, there's, it's actually, it varies from test to test, but I just pick all for tonight. You can see 42% of ours um, passed or met the, the predicted score in all their tests compared to 26 at the state level. This is just a quick look at our ACT score trend over the years. So again, we've increased our test takers over the years, and we've also increased our scores. We've had a few spike years. We've had some down years. But the trend stayed positive. But the blue is the English. Red is the math. And you can see our math scores uh, are the highest uh, in the group. It's Tammy Zunker. So Tammy, I don't think I introduced Tammy. I saw Tammy earlier. Tammy's our uh, elementary math specialist, and I know she works on a lot of that stand up tan in face of rain. Our math scores have been good. All right, so looking at our CISD uh, 10 year advanced placement trend, 
This year we had 3,324 students who took 7,588 exams. You know that one student from the Woodlands took 25 of those. But, uh, <laughs> That's why we popped up, I think. But uh, the you can see the trend since 2004. We've you know substantially have made a dent, and we keep moving. And it is our goal to keep keep growing that market share. We think we think there are a lot of our students that could take AP tests that we haven't reached yet. Really working on that. So not only we are we testing a lot of students, but we've also managed to keep our scores competitive level. And you can see how we compare it to Texas, the nation. The 2.9 mean score crowd. This is a list of top 14. Don't ask me why I picked 14. I picked 14 because I could fit 14 lines on here, but the, this was the top 14 exam and still read it. Uh, and so going down to from world history was the most popular test taken. You had 768 test takers to calculus at 290, and there were several tests that below that, but I just picked the top 14. You can kind of see how social studies is by far and away the share of our advanced placement test. Uh, have uh, number four is English, the junior level, and further down is English, the senior level. We used to have. Um, I'll, get, I'll get in that in dual credit. Some dual credit. So this is our dual credit. Um, Fifteen hundred ninety-three uh, courses that were signed up for this year. And I, I, and I was talking to, to Ms. Villarreal about it. I said, well, we're down this year and we're looking at it. But they, they changed the test. There's a new test to qualify to take college courses. What's the new one called? TSI. It's a harder test. We found that students have a more difficult time passing that in high school. The other, the other one we have uh, looked at is some of the courses that we were teaching that previously that there's been some new teaks. They don't align with the dual credit, the college credit course. So we've had to not do it for dual credit. So uh, there's been a few changes there. We've had to offer a few less things. Uh, it's always fluid if there's available faculty on the campus. But we did add this year the automated, automotive technology <laughs> with 14057. We have 45 students that are getting dual credit for automotive technology this year. So this is just kind of a general look. You can see by far our most popular is the English 1301, English 1302. And I know I've had a conversation with a couple of schools about really expanding that sophomore. See that, I think, jump up. In addition, we have a great partnership with Lone Star College. We have eight students uh, last year that completed the welding certification through the Workforce Readiness Program and 15 students that completed the phlebotomy certification. They do that at the Conroe location. It's good as they're also getting credit for high school. It's also a dual credit, but it's not getting them university credit. It's getting them work cert. In addition, we wanted to share. Uh, I think it was Miss Haynes that asked about this a couple of years ago. I wanted to update. There, we had 992 certifications earned from students in our career and technology courses last year, and this is a list. How they fall out, uh, what they, what areas they were in. Seventeen vet assistant certification, one hundred ninety nine OSHA safety certification, one hundred thirty five first aid. See the different kinds of certifications that are out there. Some of them are related to auto tech, like the Valvoline oil certification. We have 40 students that earn their certification. That's not even part of the certification. I mentioned Ms. Sunderman's here, and she's helped compile a lot of information in the full report, which is available online. And we'll, we'll make that where everybody can see it tomorrow, uh, as well as uh, there'll be a PDF of this version. But there's a lot of information in there about how our students do when they go to college. This was based on the survey from uh, uh, last year's graduates. This is what they told us. 57% said they were going to go to a, a four-year university. 28% said they were going to a two-year college. And, we, and over the last few years, that's really grown. That piece of the pie has gone up about a percent every two years. The last year. So it's gone from like 24 to 30%. Um, two-year college, and we have the vo uh, vocational technical school, 2%, 8% for full-time work. 6% uh, for part-time, 5% military, and 2% other. And they could claim more than one. 
And I know everybody's always wondering where did they go when they went to the university. We know our number one college destination is Lone Star College. Just about a quarter of our students. Um, but beyond, beyond Lone Star College, uh, last year, uh, again, it's been that way for the last several years, Texas A&M was number one with 138. And, uh, and then number two last year was UT Austin. And that, that's been up and down number two or three. Sam Houston State has really started capturing a big part of the market share. You can see where they fall in. And UTSA, um, a few years ago, we even had more at UTSA. It's, Dr. Himes, do we have some sort of... They're, they course are. correction plan in place. Yeah. I'm sorry. We have some sort of course correction plan in place. Oh. You, you, you mean you mean to you mean to say that 27 right there? I <laughs> work on this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, work, we'll work on that. So. Um, yeah, that is that, that. So UTSA used to have a program. We were, we were talking about that because we used to have a bigger number go to UTSA, but they used to have a program where they could transfer to UT. And I guess they discontinued that, and so. We had a drop off. This is the last year. So that will make a difference. That's basically the summary of your question. I would like to make one comment. Thank you for putting that report together. Um, Dr. Hines introduced our CNI department. Um, as you know, during the months of September and October, Dr. Hines and I, Ms. Strumman, and Dr. Gibson go to every campus and have academic conferences. and. And one of the questions that I ask every one of the attendees is, are you getting the support that you need from our CNI department? And um, without uh, hesitancy, they rave about the people that are in the audience tonight. And they do such a great job, and um, they work very, very hard. And you know, there, there are days in my office I, I need to get up and walk around, so I'll walk through CNI, and I never find anybody to talk to <laughs> because out on the campuses and, and that's what's critical and and they certainly model service to our to our teachers and to our principals so thank you for what you do we appreciate Great job, that. thanks for all that hard work next item on the agenda is uh, 5a administration naming of the new facilities information dr Thakka. i will ask dr gibson to come up to the podium and present the Names that have been submitted for your consideration. Good evening, President Sanders, board members, and Dr. Stockton. As you saw this evening, naming of our new schools is a very exciting process. If you remember in August, we presented to you the process for naming our new schools. And uh, tonight we have the names that have been submitted by the public for your consideration. They are as follows. For Flex 14, which most of you know is located next to Bosman Intermediate. Um, I don't know that we need to read every one of these. I'm not going to. Okay. <laughs> I'm going. We've got this list. Please don't go to your I'm ready to go. And uh, Flex 16, which is located in the Wood Forest Development. And as you know, we will return in November to ask you to name these facilities. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Oh, my gosh. All right. <laughs> Item 5B, approval of GMP. Miss, I'm sorry. I think he had a question or question. Oh, I was just I trying apologize. to apologize. He didn't uh, know the process. The process for... We have a discussion on these this meeting or next meeting? Tonight it's an informational item, and we'll come back uh, next month and ask you what your preference is. Okay. Does that mean there can be no discussion? You're welcome to discuss. Well, that was a question. Well, that's just a question. Yes. If you want to, you can. If you want to, but it's probably more relevant next month. Well, I mean, I was, it was up to you guys what your preference was of the discussion tonight or the first discuss before we vote or during voting or, or no no comment, no feedback. Usually, I mean, in the, I'll only, as a point of reference in the past, it wasn't done until we actually voted and there was a nomination on the floor and then discussion within the But that's just a historical reference. Sure. If you want to whatever. talk about them, talk about them. Oh, some, some, of the, some of the folks I didn't necessarily, I didn't recognize. Right. 
Well, and I know this is a very brief high level synopsis of, or, or what the comments that were submitted. But. The, the administration, I guess you could provide each board member with additional information if we requested it on one of the nominations. Exactly. Whatever yeah, information we have. I mean, from the information that was submitted, you could provide the board member with additional information that you had. I had already asked about some so that I'd call in and tell them the ones I was interested in, they'd give me a yeah. and Some of the names we have very little information on. Um, does anybody mm -hmm. can submit any name? Or, but we will certainly get you whatever we can find on I mean, it helped me out. So definitely, I'm familiar. Okay. Uh, well, uh, so I'm trying to understand because I'm new, like you, the process. You know, like today we had a citizen participation, which I guess will be open at the next meeting as well. Uh, but the next meeting is actually when the vote will vote. will take place, and then we'll have discussion. That's right. but, I mean, but we administration. Won't be, we won't be discussing with the audience. They just our discussion with the Oh, uh, that's what I meant. Yeah. Any any citizen can come forward and within our thirty minutes, if they register, and some probably will at the next meeting, and then we'll have nominations. The board will make nominations, and if it if it's seconded, then it move forward to a discussion item, and then we would that nomination either up or down and move on to the next we are at liberty to choose someone that's not necessarily on the list right? that is correct. yes yes so the, the uh, summary of the policy is <clears throat> we come we come at in August and we announce the uh, August September now we come and we uh, announce the schools that we are needing a name for and then we um, ask for public input we bring that input back to the board for your consideration. Uh, you're certainly not bound to stay with those nominations, but uh, it's supposed to be a reference for you. And then we'll come back in November. We'll basically come up, announce the school, and then the board takes it from there. Any other questions? Good discussion. I don't know what else. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I think we had some good discussion. We understand the process a little better. Dr. Brown? I'd like to see us. Uh, since we can't discuss outside this meeting, uh, I'd like to see us everybody just kind of maybe bring us their top one or two, and if no one if no one's interested, then we don't spend a lot of time on those matters. So you're suggesting us to do that at the next board meeting? That when we if we just cut everybody uh, kind of. Put their top two out there at the next board meeting. Yeah, so well, that'd be my preference that we bring back. I mean, for each one of us, two persons or two names. That's our preference. That way, we can narrow this down to a maximum of fourteen. Right? Yes. Yeah. If everybody brought two and they were all different, we'd have a maximum. <laughs> Something like that. That's true. <laughs> So you would do that before there would be nomination. Well, I was, my thinking was that we narrow the list down as opposed to. I have two names tonight, and then we have to vote on every person. We have You're not voting on every, on every person, though. Or get a second on a the person, then we have discussion on every person. Well, if you haven't, if I understand this correctly, if you have a nomination, somebody seconds it, and then we get a majority vote on that person then whatever school that that was thrown out there for, that, that person would, that school would be named for that person. And, and, and is, past is that history, correct? Past history is, that's exactly the way it happened. So if you want to talk about them, okay, it may be the best, th I just put this out there. If you want to talk about them, it may be the best to do it tonight because when somebody makes a nomination in a second, okay, there's some discussion there. Prayer, I, then a vote has to I'm, be taken. I'm just going to tell you, in 10 years, I have never seen a nomination go down. Okay? Fate. By the time it happens, it happens. You know what I'm saying? So if you want to talk about why uh, Ann Richards ought to be or not be or whatever you want to say, 
I mean, I, that just that's just my perspective because am I wrong? Uh, you, some of you board members have been around it. If, you know, is that is that not the truth? Well, that that has been fact. Fact. Uh, I mean, if, and yeah, I'm not saying if it's right or wrong. I'm just saying if you yeah. want to talk about them, because if you may never get to the but it's really not, it's, it, but it's really not a nomination at that point. If you're making a motion, motion. You get it second. Now then, that motion can be amended. <laughs> It can be, but it never has been, I, I, not I since I've been here. No. So, so you're usually our standing parliamentarian here. So Where's, when did I get to I don't know. Just, be, just because you always know the rules. You're a rule follower. You're the rule. I mean, you know, you know parliament, parliamentarian. I can't say that word tonight. You don't anyway, make, procedure. You're good at making it up. So um, yeah, I got the, what is the, the what would be the best forum to if yeah. if there's board members to, that want to have a dialogue about the candidates prior to actually somebody making a motion um, on the floor because that's what's going to happen at our next board meeting. What what's that process based on? The, the reason I said what I said, I just, I just think it's, I think it, it, if you want to talk about, about them, it just, nice. it, it just, it, tonight is a whole lot. There's no pressure, no vote. You can say what you want to say. You can ask a question because we really aren't supposed to have discussions amongst us. Okay. Well, not really, we're not. Let me put it that way. I just, I just, I just throw my questions out up front. Are there any of these uh, nominees, politicians? Yes. Or public officials? Which are they? Um, C.J. Haynes. Well, and you can take that oh. one off very easily. Yeah. Take that one off. Um, I would have nixed that to begin with. Wait a minute, i got to get it to a different list. Where's the other list? Um, I don't know that... Uh, and I see some got in... Does, do you, when you say uh, politician, do you mean retired? Yes. Or active? Either one. Okay. Roy Harris was a politician, and uh, Richards was a politician. Alan Moore was a politician. C.J. Haynes is a politician. Um, Donald Trump is a... <laughs> He's a politician. <laughs> anyway, so moving right along. Um, All right. I don't know about George Washington Carver. Is he a politician? No. What generally, what, for those of you that have served and gone through this process, uh, the discussion? What, uh, from what I understand, what there's I, not, this is, I don't think there is any discussion. There is. I think I'm telling you. There is. Well, that's why. So there generally is not, not that's discussion. That's my concern. Uh, well, there's uh, usually there's, discussion. There may be discussion about the name that is that is, that is, that is, that is, that is moved. The motion's made and the second's made. Then there's discussion about that name, but really, none of the other names ever seem to. See the light of day. Because that motion's on. on but anyway, to, to finish that thought, uh, yeah. Linda Sasser is uh, a politician, or has she, been, and uh, is. She, she asked that her uh, the board not. She asked me to ask the board not to her name. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> You're getting somewhere. Yeah, Tom DeLay was a politician. Okay. This is just for my own entertainment. Are you entertained? I am. Thoroughly. Yeah. Thoroughly. Just checking. Anyone else have any discussion or thought? What did we decide about the idea of that? I don't think we decided anything. We're just having discussion. I, I, we're not my, voting my, on anything. Sorry to interrupt you, Brady. That's okay. Go right ahead. My concern is that there is no dialogue, and I'm having to vote on folks that I don't necessarily know or that I have an understanding as to why we're voting on that particular person. But what ultimately happens is by default that person, there's no dialogue. We're just voting on that person. And I'm having to feel some sense of obligation to be either my or my vote. on that name, right? On that name. You know, so... Again, in the past, and I can only speak for that, names that have been submitted, I believe, or at least I can speak for myself, each individual board member took the responsibility to look at the names and then investigate the names they were interested in. And, you know, they kind of went through the process of elimination. And then they did their homework on those individuals 
and came to the meeting prepared on the nominations or the people they felt they could support. It seems that the first one up is the one we're deciding on. Much. Well, the that's an upper, it's an upper down, I mean, it's a majority vote. I mean, it. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, uh, there certainly, there certainly can be discussion once the motion's made. Made, yeah. You certainly can about that name. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I guess it, I, I think it. most people find it awkward to have whomever that person is there, and we're, we're discussing that, and you kind of feel a sense of pressure to go along with the majority, right. if you will. Right. Um, Plus, the the person that is nominated or or may be nominated might be sitting in the audience as well. Right. And then that's my concern. And that creates issues as well. It's really hard because there are so many great things. I understand. Mr. Patterson here, Charlie Patterson, um, was he a CISD educator? Yes, sir. An administrator, an assistant soup, a monitor. A deputy superintendent. Deputy, excuse me. Public servant. S served at principal of three. A bunch. How's that? Any type of public servant service? Like Outside it. of education? He was a Rotarian. The deacon at the First Baptist Church of Conroe. Um, his I'm family, sorry. he was raised in the Conroe oil field. His family worked, his dad worked in the oil field. His mother worked locally. Uh, had two brothers. Good guess. Right. Uh, former principal of CISD, I believe he was principal at three campuses. Um, <clears throat> in Houston, Lamar, and Wilkin. I believe. I, I know he opened Lamar, and I, I think he opened Wilkins, I'm not sure. Are there any that are still CISD employees on the left? Uh, Rebecca there's, Page. There's a couple on here. Let me walk through them. Uh, Becky Page. Um, Hartwell Brown's name on here is on here. Uh, just to add to con confusion, that's also his dad's name. Okay. So if it's re in reference to Hartwell Brown Jr., he's still in, in our employment. Um, Dr. Stewart. Still and Dr. Stewart is a retired, is a retired right? and she's back on yes. contract. She, she works half time for us. Yeah, but she's a retired CISD employee. As opposed to still full time. Are there any other retired CISD employees? Um, there are. Janet Bartlett. Cindy. Uh, Cindy. Okay. Uh, her name off based on her. Cindy request. Carpenter's deceased. Uh, she was one deceased. of those teachers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Hartwell Brown Hart Senior. Hartwell Brown uh, was a, was a principal. Was he? Yes. So he was principal at okay. York. All right. Uh, his, his wife Shirley still works for us. Shirley Brown is uh, Mike Fithian's retired uh, CISD principal. Barry Curtis Taylor's retired um, coordinator of, of orchestra. Linda Sasser's a retired CISD teacher. Arlene Lindsay. Arlene Lindsay's retired. Sandy Keldorf. Sandra Keldorf is retired CISD. I believe Miss Knight was what, district. Yes. She herself. Isn't that who that is? I can't hear my say Um uh, Lee Witt, Franklin Lee Witt retired. George Branch we talked about. And uh, and since Dr. Uh, Brown is kind enough to share Linda's uh, request, I will tell you that uh, Becky Page also felt like you know that was not done with her permission or knowledge, and she also asked that her name not be considered just out of <clears throat> consistency with not naming on it for an active employee. And Ms. Bartlett, is she still employed with this? No, she's retired. There's a, a Miss um, Ione Burns, who, according to the information, was retired. She's since deceased. 
<clears throat> and Mr. Moore, good. Former, former uh, board trustee. Board, board trustee. Okay. It changes a little. Was he? He was not a CISD employee. He was, he was a dentist. He was a dentist. He is a dentist. He's a dentist, he a dentist, and he was a former board trustee for what? I believe eleven years. Eleven years. Okay, so he's trustee. For and when did Janet Bartlett retire? There's probably someone in the crowd who knows that answer. Two couple. Two thousand six. And he uh, she's she's still still teaching for us part time. And she substitute. she's, she's substituting. She's substituting. I believe she's not. substituting. Any but public servant outside of the teaching? Aye. So how many of these retired teachers did you count? How many were retired teachers? I, I didn't count them as I went. <laughs> Give me just a... <laughs> sound like a good... We have good several deal. messages. Oops. Well, I'll just throw this out since we're discussing. Um, you know, there has been a history in the past of naming schools after board members, former superintendents, uh, educators that have come to an early demise for some unfortunate reason or another. I think it's safe to say that, you know, certainly in the case of Buddy Moorhead Memorial Stadium, or um, I'm not sure that a school has ever been named after an educator. I, I personally did not know Dolly Vogel. Was she a principal or an educator? Uh, she was a teacher. She was she, a teacher. She, uh, I, I believe I, she passed away during the school year. I, I didn't <clears> know the history. The next year, I believe. Would, would that be the only only exception to the teacher only school uh, that I know of? I'm, and I may be wrong uh, here, but I'm just I'm just trying to clarify history, okay? Because um, well, Bonnie was multi multi principal. Uh, <laughs> principal at multi multiple schools. You know what I'm saying is, principals has made it. I'm a Jean Giesinger was not only a principal, she was an administrator. Um, so I think Dolly Vogel is the only ex only uh, ex example of a, and even there, you know, again, she came to a premature demise and and was was honored by or the desire to honor her memory. Okay, so. Um, I would just like to say that that it is of interest of mine to recognize educators and not necessarily board members. Not necessarily, say. Not, not certainly not to the exclusion of anybody. But I, I just think that if we would recognize educators, um, they're the people that are getting the job done have gotten the job done in, in the case of, yes, they must be retired in my opinion. I, I know Dr. Brown has a has, has a firm opinion that somebody must be deceased to be named and, and I honor, I, I respect that. But if we're going to name it after somebody, I don't think they need to be a full-time employee of the district. I don't think they need to be in politics. You know, I just think there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a plenty of examples around where people have been exposed to things that have gone down the road, you know, of embarrassment, even after having something named after them or having to change the name. So uh, in that sense, but uh, educators that have been retired, educators that have done the district uh, years and years and years of service, uh, Charlie Patterson, Janet Bartlett, uh, those, those kind of people, I think they need to be considered. I can agree. And, and so I, I just I, would just like to say that. And, yeah. and well, I'm, I, agree. You know, I, I agree. I agree as well. And as I, I like the words of what Mr. Matter said of, of uh, those educators that are striving for one day, possibly having that ultimate recognition. So I, I agree with what you're saying, but, um, just for discussion purposes. And let me uh, say one other thing, of it, and, and then I am truly through. I, I was I was 
I was concerned for a while that, that recognizing uh, somebody that had been in administration or superintendency or, or something like that would in somehow offend the rest of the teaching population that has done such a fine job. And I have been duly corrected on that for what it's worth. Uh, I am confident that educators, are, and I'm sure there's somebody out there that that, that uh, doesn't want Charlie's name on a school or Janet's name on a school, but I hadn't met them yet. Okay, they, they may be there, but I hadn't met them, and I've heard quite the contrary in my in my studies around town. So, with that said, I think it's honoring one is 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 in some form or fashion honoring all, uh, even though that person and goes on the building, so. With that being said, what's the differentiating, what distinguishes one versus the many, many retired teachers, very well-deserving teachers in CISD, what's the, what's the differentiating factor? I, we don't I, have that many schools. I, that's correct. That's exactly what I said. That, that's why I said that. I was concerned about nominating or even naming, I mean, even the successful naming of a school after one teacher. And then, you know, I had a second grade teacher that was great too, and so did Ray. And, and, and any CISD graduate out here in this audience probably had a second grade teacher that wasn't Janet Bartlett. I mean, just give an example. But I'm telling you that I've had teachers and educators and administrators and public servants and leaders in this community tell me that's not a concern. Because she is, did, and, and there's other teachers on here and principals that have been retired and done a, a fantastic job as well. Gene Stewart and Marlene Lindsay, go without speaking. So, you know, I'd, 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 I'd hate to answer, to, to, to throw out a discussion on your question about what dif dif differentiates um, uh, as those that are elected, I think we, we turn to the public, public support, that to me, one factor. I get. I still struggle with that because you know, based on John's argument, we'd be indifferent as to which teacher we chose because one represents all. Um, I, I do appreciate the energy and the passion behind a campaign. I, I, I can't say that enough. But at the same time, I don't. I don't want us to take it as popularity uh, contest, and uh, I don't mean to minimize or marginalize the efforts that have been put forth, but um, like I said, I, we, we have many, many distinguished educators in CISD, Conroe Feeder, Stone and Conroe High, so I, I need a little bit something to help me um, have a better appreciation as to why we should choose one over the other. That, that's kind of where I struggle with on that. Um, secondly, I'd like to, Wood Forest, I saw Wood Forest here received a ton of votes. I had several concerns with that. Yeah, I had several concerns with that too. We named the school after a street before, well, and I never quite figured that one out, but anyway, Wood Forest I lost is, that vote. They're a company, and I hate to give the perception that this wasn't an arm's length transaction. So. Seems like we're doing some sort of indirect advertisement, either for the subdivision or the or the bank. So either or, uh, I, I would hesitate to do. That's sort of my concern with that. I mean, you guys have any feedback on that? Well, I think when you look at the names of the forest, the only thing when I would read the names was for all individuals that live in that development. So to me, they were trying to bring forth a sense of community and that I don't think they were recognizing the company. I think they were recognizing the community in which they live right. and they want to create a further sense of community. I mean, that's okay. what I got. When I looked up the addresses of the people that had submitted, most, if not all, were within that community. So, I can appreciate so that. that's where I think they're coming from. And to mm -hmm. me, that makes sense we want our schools to be within a community if yes. you so choose to name a school within a community agreed we did we did have we did charge for naming rights to name the stadium with for us right but, that's, yeah. but that was for the company 
Well, I mean, most people are going to perceive it. What for development is a company, and the bank holds the notes. Well, I'm not, arguing either. I'm not arguing either way. I'm just saying the people that submitted those names were from the community. Yeah. I and Wood Forest Stadium was a business transaction of which the district got payment for. I would feel better if it was a check <laughs> at hand before I did some. <laughs> The version's on the I, had a, I had a question. Well, then we should have everyone on here submit a check if you're asking the community to do that. Well, yes, if they have a corporation and we're naming it after that, We're yeah, not I, naming I it after like, a corporation. We're naming it after yeah, the community the based same. on the people that submitted it. Yeah, That's all well, I'm saying. Well, I had a quick question for, for CJ um, and, and kind of in response to what Patron was saying about um, how well-known somebody may be is... I'm understanding correctly, like you said, going out and doing your research. So if you have leaders in the community, people that have come forward, that have uh, spent the time and effort to put somebody forth, then that research includes going and sitting down with them or having coffee with them or at least having a phone call to find out why is it so important to you that you're passionate about naming a school after a particular educator. Is that... Oh, I can appreciate that. Yeah, that's true. I think uh, that's I true. I mean, if if you're thinking of a name, I think part of that due diligence is finding out why that person was, you know, patron's uh, concern of several educators are on our list. What makes one better or why would you go with this name versus that name? Because any group that has submitted names is very passionate about the names and they're, they're all wonderful names. So any are deserving, and so it's our decision to discern which name we want to go with. But I personally but have to do the due diligence on why I feel that name deserved it, and that would involve talking to people, some of these people that submitted these names. Maybe I want to just tell me do my homework. Just well. Oh no, well, that's <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think this is doing your homework. I think this they is doing your homework. Your homework. Yeah. Well, you Everybody know, does it differently. I, I took one or two of those classes. I, I'm just, <laughs> but when you ask about that and the number that come up here and uh, or yeah. support anything, some of those people are feel that somebody said to me, I'm not sure exactly why I'm here tonight for them. And they feel pressured to support to support because somebody asked them to, whether it's in writing and just because they got enough people to write. And if you read some of the things we've gotten, we don't, they don't know much about the person other than they were a good teacher or they were good this and, but they yeah. feel pressured also. Well, yeah. Dr. Brown, you know, the other side to that is people like George Branch have been forgotten by most. I mean, my mama worked for him and, and I remember Dr. George Branch, okay? And like, you know, uh, like somebody else might remember, you know, somebody in this era okay and he was a good man you know it's i don't know i mean they just were they were just nominating superintendents and and, and board members back then you know they didn't they didn't uh really go down the principal route but uh but you know we can talk about another name here charlie patterson he is a man among men i i've never met anybody that 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 had a bad word to say about charlie and uh i'm just telling you he um, he was a uh, a guiding light in this district for a number of years. Yes, is maybe that's the wrong. I mean, he was just. He didn't sign up. Well, I Adrian, I applaud you for. I'm glad we're having this discussion. If it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be having this. And I think this is extremely. Well, I appreciate helpful. that, and I didn't want anybody to feel like I was. I like it. But um. Yeah, I don't have my peer pressure well, so I didn't want you guys to throw a name out there, and I had to. <laughs> Any other if, you want, if you want Donald Trump, you just need to See, say that, that was my just first. Set up, just set up a meeting with him and do some I mean, you just, I mean, if we're going to get a check, we might as well get a big check. No, in, in all seriousness, I, I, I can appreciate the the um, contributions. That my wife's an educator. Let me preface the conversation by saying that. Um, my mother-in-law is an educator. I mean, from, in, from a generation of educators. Um, but yeah, I have an expectation that of, of my wife and any educator and has to be a great at what you do. Um, and you're paid for it. 
some may argue that you're underpaid for it. Uh, depends on who you ask. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure the majority of folks will say that they're underpaid for what they do and for the lives and and um, all that they contribute to our, our bringing up our young ones. Uh, and I would be the first as a parent to second that. I have three three uh, young ones, two of which are CISD students as well. Um, but I still struggle with us singling out one educator and. Um, I just, I just, I just have my concerns with just seeing that one educator, uh, simply because if we're seeing that one educator represents them all, then we're quite indifferent to which one we chose because they're all great. Uh, I'm pretty sure I could ask Dr. Stockman for 30, 40, 50 retired educators that he would consider highly distinguished um, from the local Conroe area over the last three, four years, and he could easily produce that list. Um, and again, I, I don't mean to take the energy or the passion or, or marginalize any efforts that were put forth here by any, any specific campaign. I don't have a dog in that hunt necessarily, but um, that was my concern going into the election process uh, next month. Uh, in addition, I had my concerns with naming after a um, subdivision or a corporation or I understand them, the residents of that subdivision, I understand their intent um, was probably not to do that, but um, as a person that's making a decision, I have to see all angles of that or, or, or consequences of doing mm -hmm. such. Um, outside of that, 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 that's all I had. Well, I can I can also add, though, a, it, as far as there's been a number of principals that have been honored school names, okay? And they have also been chosen from a pool of what I feel like, I mean, let's face it, they don't get that position. I know. Dr. Stockton's hired a number of them, and, and they're all fantastic individuals. Uh, for some reason, some of them have uh, become beloved and, and, and received an honor. Bonnie Wilkinson, I mean, I, I can't explain why that principal versus George Branch, but it's happened, okay? Uh -huh. and, and, of course, George Branch has not had one name, which he still could, so I don't, I'm just saying, I don't know... Uh, well, I mean, uh, how do how do other school districts? Well, you know, we actually um, looked at different policies, and Dr. Brown actually Dr. Brown, is the right? one who wrote the policy. Well, it's been a minute. He's disclaiming that. It's not a free market. I did I did a lot of research, uh, and but they vary considerably. Uh, so, some had committees that brought forth. Right. A recommendation. We had, uh, under the original policy, we had it uh, where it went to a committee that made recommendations. We made a selection to us. committee. We District didn't have level. To be by, found committee. by that committee that it was viewed by others. Uh, I, when I originally wrote the thing, I had it that it had a committee from the location in which the student was served. And some, and there are a few, almost mine, uh, philosophy that not named them after living people, obviously. But I mean, it's all over the board. But I will say one policy that said, "Wow, this is easy." Or yeah. this is easy. <laughs> but I will but, uh, say, you know, to Dr. Brown, uh, because uh, he did suggest it, I think, ten years ago, or whatever it was, uh, you know, to choose a committee that was in that surrounding area. But by default, by opening it up to the community wide, we tend to get submissions of names that are surrounding those schools that we're naming, because those are the people most interested. And so it ends up being kind of a more community-wide committee, if you will, because those are the ones that submit the names, create the campaigns, um, and have the most passion because it's in their backyard. Yeah. So it, it sort of becomes a default committee. But at the time when Dr. Brown researched it and wrote the policy, and then the board adopted it, there wasn't uh, one size fits all. There wasn't any rhyme or reason that every district or the majority of the districts handle school naming in a certain way. And I did, and when we had the advisory, 
first. I don't see that we got any uh, better information, information there than we do since that committee's been removed. Even though that was. We're idea. probably getting more names now. One more thing, and I'll, I'll take my seat, if you will. <laughs> we did, we, you did say we had some, we currently have schools that are named up for principals, right? Yes. Yeah. Multiple. And we are considered those few educators, correct? Yes, they're. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, other comments? I just want to make a comment myself. I've been respectful of everyone's time. But in discussion about Wood Forest, I'm employed by the bank. I'm not employed by Wood Forest Development Company, and I don't live in Wood Forest, but I will state that in the next three weeks I'm moving out to Wood Forest. <laughs> All right, man. So I want to be up front and I want to be as transparent as I can, but comments were made regarding writing a check, and I just want to make some comments that Wood Forest has participated both human resources and financial resources in junior achievement, read for a better life, Montgomery County Fair, band trailers, stadium signs, food bank, Habitat for Humanity, and now a community is named after that organization. I believe that that organization came to Montgomery County to build a community. It's done exactly what it said it was going to do and has done and continues to do. And I'm just going to state that I am in favor of naming the school in Wood Forest after the community, not the bank, not the development company, but that I feel like that name does transcend Montgomery County in a very large way when they moved in. So here, I've said my piece too. Good. All right. Anyone else have any comments? So the checks be cashed on those. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I agree. I, I didn't concur. mean to, I I didn't concur. Mean, okay. I didn't mean to say that Wood Forest wasn't an yes. excellent contributor. Are we going to item B? Yeah. I just didn't know what we can do. 5B. Is that what All we're going right. to? If we, have, if we have gone through 5A, all right. Well, I've never been here. What we're, how are we going to get the names here? Are we going to? Is everybody going to bring? Are we going to bring two back, or uh, what? What do y'all think on that? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that's a great idea. I'm okay with that. It did just a point, though. If, even if you point. say you're going to do that, someone can still make a, a motion. Well, right. how, how about this? So as we do not embarrass any one member over another, would it be okay if each of uh, submitted names and I just read off the names rather than saying you done you do this and you do that I think that's probably that be a, okay better, that, a better that way, yeah, that's, that's submission a so so as the president what I think it's a great idea prior night, to the board meeting submit no, me, our me, two can names can, can I amend that just uh, just okay, I'm just asking hear me out. if you'll submit those to me okay. that's great that way the board members aren't talking about that's great I like okay, that that's idea great. That can I also suggest that if we just read them all right but can i suggest that if we all chose donald trump let's don't say he got six votes no no no, just, no, no, no this that's why i want it okay. that's why i wanted this to the name that, that, that good that's, that's fine okay I, I think that's a great I idea i think that's Dr. a great idea too all righty any more questions or the questions been Thank answered. You. Thank you for advising yes. me, guys. No, no, no. This is Perfect. good discussion. Great. All right. Discussion. We're no. No. Well, education's our job. I was going to say, <laughs> it's nice when you got that as a discussion item. Is yes. How important because we have so many great people named and nominated, and it is going to be a difficult process mm -hmm. just because of that. All right. Item 5D is approval of GMP miscellaneous mechanical repairs phase two, Dr. Stock. Easy Foster, you'll come present that item. All right, President Sanders, Dr. Stock, and members of the board, it's my pleasure to bring forward tonight our recommendation that you approve a project we call the miscellaneous mechanical repairs phase two. We've selected Ellisor constructors uh, to be the construction manager at risk for this project. They've exhibited the ability to successfully complete many pro uh, other projects of similar magnitude and complexity with Connor ISD, and they make a good choice for this project. The project we're presenting tonight covers seven campuses, uh, Knox Junior High, McCullough Junior High, Haley Elementary, the Woolens High School ninth grade, Caney Creek High School, Oak Ridge High School, and Ford Elementary. The work we propose on these campuses totals $16,600,000 
$410 to be funded from the 2008 bond fund. At this time, we recommend that you approve this process, this project. And then. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve. Is there any discussion? Not all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right. Item 5C, bond referendum update. Dr. Stein. I'll ask uh, Mr. Foster to continue with this item. Yeah, Mr. Sanders, Dr. Stockton, members of the board, it is my pleasure to update you on the current major projects that are funded with the 2008 bond referendum funds. Starting with Flex School number 14, this is an elementary school next door to Bosman Intermediate that is scheduled to open in August of 2014 for school next year. The project is approximately 70% complete. The exterior masonry is worked all the way around to the front doors. As you can see, they're preparing to do that work now. Interior-wise, this project is uh, approaching the finishing stage. So you can see that this is a picture of the interior of the gym. The coating for the exposed structure has been done. The base coat on the walls has been done. The next step here would be to start adding the, the colors that have been selected for this school. This is a, uh, a look at the commons area, the stage. You can see the drywalls in place. The mechanical systems are uh, near completion. As well, looking into the library, you see it's progressing uh, at a rapid rate. We've also got many, many of the finished items in this. Uh, you're looking at a classroom stacked with the uh, educational casework, ceiling grids in place, things of that nature. Flex school number 16 is the elementary school in the Wood Forest community off of Fish Creek Thoroughfare. It is approximately 65% complete. It is on schedule. It is scheduled to open in August of 2014 as well. They are likewise working around the building towards the front door. Uh, as you can see, uh, they're progressing well. They have not made quite the progress that uh, that Flex 14 has. That's due to their, their starting. They started at different levels, but started at the same time. But you can see their mechanical systems are in place. Uh, their, their next step are the drywall, the framing, and then we get into the colors and the other materials going in there. This contractor chose to start in the classroom end, so you're starting to see some of the things you saw in the gymnasium on the opposite end of the building. They're just building it from their <laughs> pattern from the other direction. And that is our update. Thank you, Mr. Thank Foster. You. Thank you. Item 6A, financial reports. Yes, I believe sir. the board's been given those reports. Yes, President, I, I'd suggest that we uh, not uh, that tonight since we've been given those reports to review. All right. Second. That thing of the committee. Okay. Have a seat, Darren. Darren smiled. Thank you, I think he's ready to go home. Thank too. you for all your hard work. <laughs> you know, he, he did, just for the record, he did have to present the public hearing. So, yeah. 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 Now, if you would like to run those dollar signs across the screen, come on up and do that. <laughs> like that. We do appreciate all you do for Good us. Job, Darren. All right. And we don't have an executive session tonight. Uh, item nine, <laughs> legal. Uh, so move. We have a um, item on our agenda, a proposed termination authorization. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the board approve the recommendation of the superintendent as presented and that the board propose the termination of term contract teacher Harold Gregory Goodrum and authorize the superintendent to give notice to Mr. Goodrum. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed motion carries unanimously. We have a motion to Second. adjourn. Second. We're adjourned. Thank you for being here. Sorry for the jeans.